Good morning, everybody. Let's turn to page number 12 this morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name today. Page number 12 in your psalm books today. Page number 12. Let's all gather in this morning and honor the Lord today through our singing. Page number 12. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed all stand this morning. Where have you all been? My goodness, good to see all of your frowning, sad faces today. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God today? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today for how good you are. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, that someday we will cast all of our crowns at your feet and honor you and glorify you. And Lord, that is just the beginning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love toward us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blood of Christ that cleanses. Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You're dismissed to your classes today. Chapter 5. Good morning, everybody. How y'all perking? All righty. Uh, you, you don't have no idea what to bring Bible class, do you? Just your Bible. At least if you bring your Bible, you know you're in good shape. Amen. But uh, we are uh, in uh, Romans chapter 5, getting ready to go into Romans chapter 6. And we uh, should have... Hmm. There it is. If you've got your lesson number two on grace, that'd be good to get it out because we're going to finish that this morning. And the thing you want to keep in mind uh, while we're right where we're at, there's a transition from Romans 5 to Romans 6 from, you know, the establishment of the fact of the holiness of God, the sinfulness of men, the guilt of mankind, and the remedy for it in Christ's death and so forth. Um, and, and, and how the law can't save us and how all it is is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and how that, uh, you know, it's shifted, it brought us up to grace there in chapter 5. And it talks about how grace reign, reigns and we've looked at all that and we've actually been two Sundays on this issue about grace. And uh, so 
<clears throat> last week, if I'm not mistaken on this lesson number two on grace, we uh, left off down in number three there on the first page, there on the front page at Titus chapter two. And that's where I want us to go to when we're going to read for just a little bit and then we're going to go to Titus chapter two and then we'll kick in. But let's pray first. Lord, we thank you for this day. God, I pray that you'd help us just to settle down and relax and rest in Christ and that we'd come to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we'd be enthused, but Heavenly Father, at the same time, be rest to our spirits and rest to our souls and our bodies and our minds. And Lord, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. I pray, God, that you'd help us to feed the flock of God and that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God, that we might apply these great doctrines of the Bible to our lives and that would affect and make us to be the people that you want us to be, that it would be a practical effect in our lives. Lord, we need that, and I just pray that you'd help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take off reading at chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up at verse number 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. So we're talking about the sin of Adam, the, man, the sin of mankind against God, so also the free gift, and that free gift is the eternal life that Jesus Christ gives us uh, through his sacrifice. For if through the offense of one, that's Adam, be, many be dead. And by the way, the Bible says we're dead in trespasses. And does anybody need a lesson number two on the, on, or lesson two on grace? Just a handout. If you do, just flag your hand and he's got some extra copies there and be glad to give it to you if you need one. <clears throat> okay. It said then much more. And we talked about the last two weeks how chapter five is, I call it the much more chapter and I tell you, that's something you need to get a hold of because if I'm not careful in my fleshly mind, uh, my sin just gets to be, how, how many's ever got this kind of despondent and despaired at yourself over sin? Yeah. It's just like the sin is so big and it's just so much and so prominent, so prevalent. And I, the one of the things God really wants us to do here is to make, uh, make us understand that where sin abounded, and it does seem like it's abound, abound. I don't know about, I, I'm, for me, it just seems like sin abounds, you know. But he's saying grace did much more abound. And if you don't, if we don't keep that in mind, I'm going to tell you something. We'll be depressed Christians. That's why grace must be taught and preached and practiced. Because he said where sin did abound, and it does. And Paul's going to really get into this in chapter 7. That that I would do, I do not. That that I would not, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. You know, we, we, you know we, we want to do right, we know to do right, and then we don't do right. We don't think right. Don't talk right, you know. <laughs> it just seems like the further I go, the worse it gets. This chapter right here, I'm going to be honest with you, it's like if you're not careful, you're like a person in, a, in a, a flood of iniquity and your head's just barely above water and you, you come along here and God's saying, hey, <clears throat> get your eyes off all the sin. Get your eyes on the grace, because if you don't, I'm going to tell you, I, you, you can say what you want to. We, we need to live right, all that. We're going to get into some of that. We're going to get into sanctification, all that. But I'm going to tell you, at our, <clears throat> you're going to get into chapter 6, and it's going to tell you to reckon and yield and know. It's going to tell you to take some responsibility. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, but I don't know about you, but if, if, if grace doesn't abound much more, then my sin, I'm in big trouble. I'm in big trouble. And I'm not going to lie to myself or twist things around in my mind to make things be different than they really are. <clears throat> now, I know there's a lot of people, a lot better Christian than I am. I'm glad for them. But in this old hillbilly, sin does abound. But grace does much more abound. And, and, and whether I apply that or not, so what I'm saying is wh whether you comprehend it, apply it, believe it, know it, doesn't make a difference. It still does. And, we'll, and even if you don't know it, you'll find it out. And when you go to be with the Lord, you'll find out the grace was abounding even when you didn't realize it. So I just really want to drive this home. Do not get, do not let yourself get weighted down about your failure. If you could have been sinless, why would have you needed a Savior? <clears throat> And if you and I, if it's, you know, grace gives God glory. That's, that's why grace is so sweet. It, it takes the glory where it should be. Grace gives glory to God. When people get a hold of grace, as long as we think we're doing it, and you know, it's in our strength and effort, then it's, it's not. But anyway, 
He said there, <clears throat> uh, which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. And we know that. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one. Boy, I'll tell you what. Man. Reigning death. It just seems like so many people I know are aged and I guess I'm in that generation and dying. We've seen so much death in the last two years and I mean and nobody escapes it. I mean it just it rains. We have to have, you know, boy I gave you something good in that. Um, in the book of Esther, O Haman, who's a picture of Satan, got the king to decree a sentence of death against God's people. And you couldn't overturn the law of the Medes and Persians. And you can't, you can't turn around the, the, the law of sin and death. But there could be a law that superseded it. And that's what they did. And Jesus, by his death, burial, and resurrection, by his payment of sin, created the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And it supersedes the law of sin and death. Well, you got to get a hold of that. Because if, you, if I didn't have a hold of that, I mean, you know, I just down at my mother's and, you know, she's not well. And Barry's 94. And Brother Jim, he's, you know, and then just all around us, people that I know across the country. And this one, this one passed away and that one passed away. And boy, death is just, you know, it's just like a scythe, you know, just going through a field, cutting people down. But I'm glad that life is raining. And it rains so powerful that for this body, it, this, this tabernacle be laid down. I have a tabernacle in heaven, not made with hands. And to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord. And Christ, through his sacrifice, his gospel, that good news, is life reigns instead of death. But I need to apply it in a practical way to my daily living. Because if I don't, I'll be honest with you, it, it's like your joy goes down the drain. They always see it, sin and death, sin and death, sin and death. You look at our country, sin and death, sin and death. And if I don't get a hold of these truths about life reigning in Christ, grace reigning in Christ, and his victory over sin and death and the grave and hell, there's, it's hopeless. But we have it, and that's what I'm, I just want to drive that home. <clears throat> Verse 18 Therefore, be the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, and that's Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, if I'll say it all together, here we go. Grace did much more abound. There you go. Get that, get that, get that. Grace did much more bound. Um, have you ever said to yourself, I just can't live it? Guess what? You're right. He has to live it through us, and it's his life, and it's his righteousness, and everything. But where sin abounded, just always remember that grace did much more bound. His grace is abounding grace. It's more than we need. It's beyond all the, uh, that, that song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. Got to get a hold of it. That as sin hath reigned unto death, and that's what we've been talking about, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And then chapter 6, <clears throat> what shall we say then? Because of this, you know, there's a, because of this reigning grace, because of this abounding grace, because there's much more grace, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, believe it or not, there were people, and I suppose still are today, but it kind of seems off, so off base, it's hard. There were people that took the grace of God and said, well, the more I sin, the more grace I'll get, so that glorifies God, so I'll just sin more, so I get more grace. And they used it for an excuse to sin. And Paul's dealing with that. I mean, this, this was, this was, there was a group of people that took grace 
and said, well, if, if, if that's the way it is, why? Uh, they just twisted it immediately, just took it to its, to its wrong conclusion and said, well, the more I sin, the more grace I get, and the more glory God gets out of that. And that ain't right. It's, it's, total, it's total misconception of what grace is. And uh, so that's why we're going to go now to Titus chapter 2. So take your Bible to Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> And then we'll kind of take off and get our boat out of the, the what, what's that where they put the what, boat, you know, you can't go very fast till you get past a certain point. The breakwater. Wake. 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 You know, that always bothered me. I never was on the lake much, but you go out there, you're supposed to go real, real slow, five mile an hour till you get to certain points, you know, and I wanted to go, you know. But there's a reason for that. And sometimes when you get in the Bible class or preaching, you kind of got get through the wake and then you get out and go. Uh, Titus chapter 2, verse number uh, 10, not purloining, that means, purloining is a, is a word that relates to stealing, uh, various kinds of stealing, but showing all good fidelity, that's honesty, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Watch verse 11 now, watch it. For the grace of God, there it is, the grace of God that bringeth salvation, it also hath appeared to all men. That's a big verse. We won't, we won't break in on that. But teaching us, and here's what grace does, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live <clears throat> soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and uh, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, that's another verse on the deity of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and look at what grace, is, grace, the, grace does. It purifies unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So what we're kind of want to do this morning <clears throat> is move into the idea of what does grace do in a practical way to a man's life. And there's kind of an attitude that, well, I'm saved by grace, and so we just kind of set. And that's, that's wrong. First of all, if this verse is teaching that grace teaches us. Uh, there it, to deny godliness and worldly lust. I'll say it again. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, grace is the mother and nurse of holiness, not the apologist for sin. And you only get that. Because this is where the battle about grace, because a lot of times you hear churches or denominations or preachers talking about grace. They don't always mean what the Bible means. They'll use the same word, but they've got a different meaning in what they're talking about. When the Catholic Church talks about grace, they're not talking about the grace of the Bible at all. They're talking about the grace of the church in granting you forgiveness or through Mary or through all their contraptions and, and so forth. They're not talking about the same thing at all. When the Mormon church talks about grace, they're not talking about biblical grace at all. But they use biblical terms, and this is why we can be wise as serpents and harmless as dove. You want to listen to what they say and, and, and take it against the Word of God. Amen. And when they use those words, <clears throat> be sure, you know, you, because that's why the Bible needs to be one to, de to define it. But grace, although it's free and it's all of the Lord, it's not going to give you a license to sin. This is why Paul said, what then shall we say? Can we, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And he's going to hammer that in. So, we're down there at uh, chat, uh, number three on, on lesson two. And it teaches us, uh, we'll back up there with Romans 6.14. The Christian lives under grace, Romans 6.14. He's established with grace in Hebrews 13.9. 2 Peter 3.18, we grow in grace. Titus 2.11, it teaches us to live righteously. And 2 Thessalonians 2.16, so guys, start running ahead of me. And we're going to flip the page and get all these verses and finish this one. 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Who's got that? Anybody get that? 2 Thessalonians 2.16. If you have that, one of you men stand and read that, please. <clears throat> Go ahead, brother. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. All right. Our everlasting consolation, our good hope, it's through grace. And um, I'm telling you something, grace is just the absolute, the linchpin of your Christian life. Uh, I don't know, just it, the, the grace of God in every situation. I, I'm, I'm kind of seeing like going through just a, 
you know, a, a hard time in my life, just spiritually. You know, I'm, I don't have the joy I'd like to have. I, I'm just not, I don't have the vibrance I'd like to have. Uh, just some issues, you know, that just kind of keeps trying to drag me down. But, but joy of the Bible is not dependent upon circumstances. It's not dependent on how well I feel and that kind of stuff. And you've got to get a hold of that. You've got to get grace for those spiritual battles, for that spiritual warfare, getting grace. And I want to encourage you, pray for grace. Ask God, Lord, give me grace for this. Lord, give me grace for this. Lord, give me grace in this situation. Lord, give me, I want to ask you today, again, we did this about two, but are there some situations where you need grace in and you're not, maybe not ashamed or maybe not the shame necessarily, but you know, I'm not a believer in hanging your dirty laundry out in front of everybody, but is there somewhere we say, Lord, give me, I mean, just to be honest with you, you need grace to be a father. You need grace to raise your children. You need grace to be a husband. You need grace to be a mother. You need grace to do the dishes. You need grace to do the laundry. You, know, you need grace to put up with people all the time. Is, is that not right? And Lord, give me grace. Uh, you got an employee or you got a boss or whatever it is. And, you know, you just all kinds of nonsense going on. And Lord, give me grace. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Lord, I just want this church to get this. Go out tomorrow. And when that stuff starts coming, just say, Lord, give me grace. Lord, give me grace. <clears throat> the Bible says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Lord, give me grace. Just to hold my mouth. I, I, who, who in here did, got, messes with horses a lot? And you got, has anybody here got an old bridle you're not using? I want you to bring up, I want somebody to bring a bridle. It don't have to be a good one. Uh, put, make it, uh, what's the meanest bit that you can get? Huh? I can't understand. Spade. 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 Oh, I want somebody to bring the, a bridle, maybe two of them. Wouldn't hurt to have one, one on that pole and one on this pole. Because the Bible said to put a bridle on your tongue. And I think if we'd hang a bridle up in the church, it'd help us all, wouldn't you? So every time we look at that bridle, bridle the tongue. So you bring one and you folks bring one, okay? And we're going to hang a bridle up. <clears throat> On each side, and every time you look at it, just think about, Lord, put a bridle on my tongue. I heard about a preacher this week who said every morning he gets up, the first thing he does when his foot hits the floor is say, Lord, bridle my tongue. The tongue is set on fire of hell. Done more damage. It, by the way, it never had this thought before. It, did you know the Bible teaches that if you can con get your tongue controlled, which you can't, the Bible says no man can tame the tongue. So that, why, that's why we need grace. That power of God, the desire of God, the power of God to refrain, to bridle that tongue. Uh, that if that, if we, if, if we can get the grace to get our tongue bridled, we can manage every other situation of the body. That's what your Bible says. That if you can bridle that tongue, the rest of it can be, will follow down. And so I have kind of, on, on my personal walk at the Lord, my personal Christian experience right now, <clears throat> I'm saying, Lord, I, I, I preach all the time, so I run my mouth a lot. And here you're supposed to bridle my tongue. And, um, but in my personal spiritual growth, I just want to, I just want to say less. Yes? Stop. You're riding a horse. You're going. Control. You're controlling where you're That's a good thought. Thank you. I need that. Yes, Brother Larry. Yeah. Well, the tongue never wears out. You never hear of a transplant tongue. <laughs> Somebody write that one down. Put that over there on that wall. <clears throat> well, you guys are loaded for bear this morning. I mean, what he said was good there. It doesn't mean it necessarily stops. It's just under control. You ever see a horse with a bridle and didn't want one? Yeah. Trying to rake that thing out on a tree or a fence post? Yes. I used to ride horses a lot. A lot of times you had to take your hand and open the mouth. Oh, yeah. Get the bridle in. Try their teeth over. Oh, shoot, yeah. I've seen them go, Arr. Yeah. You bang it against their teeth two or three times. <laughs> you reckon that's how hard it would be for God to bridle us? Worse. Jim. You need to find a way to somehow incorporate the keyboard finger on your phone in that too. Amen. The what? The keyboard, your keyboard finger for your phone. 
needs oh, to be included in that Text somehow. messages? <laughs> well, social media. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, boy, I had a dandy this week. I ain't even going to tell you. I mean, there are some low lifes out there. Mercy sakes of life. <clears throat> I'm just going to say this. It takes a pretty good coward to say stuff 500,000, 1,100 miles away behind a phone that you wouldn't say to a man to his face. You're, you're a coward. If you're listening to me today, you're a coward. <laughs> You come down, I'll meet you at the parking lot. Amen? Let's see if you want to say that. <clears throat> I mean, that's my flesh. Amen? That's my tongue unbridled. Amen? No, person, that's a, to be honest about it, that's, that's why you got to bridle it. There's just some things ain't worth responding to. They're so cowardice. They're so, you know, so vile. But anyway, Sam, you bring one, and Brett, you guys bring it, Bradley. We're going to hang them up over here on each side. And just remind ourselves, Lord, bridle my tongue, because the Bible says no man can tame it. Yes, sir. And even if you don't bridle it, everything you say, you're going to give an account for That's it. right. Every word. Every word. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Anyway, let's get on the backside, Christ, grace and Christian service. Boy, this is good. Somebody get Romans 15, 15. Would you get, anybody got that? And guys, go ahead down through there and be looking this up. Somebody be ready. And, you know, if you're not the first one up, it ain't the end of the world. Who's got the Romans 15, 15? Yes, Brother Lonnie. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written thee more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. All right. Grace and Christian service. Now, I'm going to say this much. I don't know very much about the ministry, but I know one thing. You sure do need a lot of grace. Need a lot of grace. I'll be honest with you right now. I'm just about hard. I'm just, I'm just about hard. And I, that's not good. I'm just, I'm, I'm going, I'm just, I've confessed it to God because I just ain't, God knows everything. But it's the truth. <clears throat> you just get uh, so much garbage. After a while, you're just hard. And I don't want to be hard. I don't want to be calloused. Uh, the Bible said be tender, uh, you know, tender hearted. Be kind one to another, tender hearted. Uh, not hard hearted. The Bible warns against hard heartedness. <clears throat> I, I will tell you something. I've watched over the years, and, you know, by the grace of God, Karen and I are still together in our marriage, but I've watched people that, you know, went through divorces and and I'll be honest with you, I think especially women, because I think their expectations about marriage is a little different than men's in a sense. But when, especially when a woman's been mistreated, I've seen women get super hard. You know, I've been around, I've been around a lot of it. And they just get, you know, they, they, if they're not careful, they'll get to where they hate men. Because of the way they've been treated, the way they've been done. And they they're have a hard time giving their heart to anyone because it's been so wounded, so beaten up, so, so butchered, abused. And so they get hard. And their response is to, to never, you know, to never love again. And they'll even get married because they want the security and they want the companionship and all that. But there's still that hardness. I'm, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I've seen this, and it, 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 I've done a lot of thinking about it. Huh? Yeah. And I mean, and I don't say this condemning. I just say because I'm in the ministry, and I'm hard. You know, there's a side of me that's not, but there's a side of me that is. And uh, <clears throat> I'll just tell you that what we need is more grace. One of the greatest things I ever heard, I was coming home from a revival meeting, and I've said this many times, but I was back probably in the 80s, late 80s maybe, or mid, eight, mid to late 80s. I was coming home, and I was going, we was having, you know, somebody asked me yesterday about oh, a pastor. I've had, pray for me, I get a lot of calls from pastors, and <clears throat> there's, there's just a lot of discouragement out there, and of course, but... You know, a guy asked me, he said, well, how long did it take, you know, to kind of get the church going and so forth, like, you know, about uh, so forth. I said, well, I don't know. But I said, to be honest with you, you know, probably about it was late 80s before things really got lined out, seemed like, and, and got through a lot of the old traditional stuff that had to wade through and, and go through. 
And, uh, <clears throat> but I was coming down the road, and I had a lot of junk going on. It was real late, late at night. And this guy was talking on some Christian station, and he said that if you're not careful, he said you get hurt and wounded uh, in the ministry. And then he said, you know, he said, it's like you took your heart out and you laid it out there for people. And they just butchered it up. They just, they just butchered it. And pretty soon you're like, you're just in gasping mode. And you reach out and you pull back into your chest what's left of your heart. And you build a wall around it and say, nobody's ever going to hurt me again. I will not put my heart out on the table of life for anybody to hurt me again. And he said, that's one of the worst mistakes you'll ever make. And that, I, I personally think that's a great, great truth. Because God's grace enables us to love our enemies. God don't tell us to love our enemies without giving us grace to do it. God's grace is enough grace to forgive people. The whole key of Christianity is getting more grace, but he giveth more grace. And it, it says grace in Christian service. This applies to everybody. This isn't about preachers. This isn't about missionaries. This is, this is this talking about Christian service. We're all serving the Lord, and we all need grace. And if you serve, I'm going to tell you something. If you were lost and in the casino business today, somebody's going to hurt you. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or lost. You're going to get hurt in life. But it's better to have a God within you who has grace to handle the hurts. And I don't know, maybe I'm just kind of about this lesson. I don't know where it's going for sure. But my whole deal is we've got to get more grace. I know it. I got to get more grace. Every situation that comes, I got to get more grace. And there are people sitting out in front of me this morning. I mean, I look at your lives and I say, Lord, you must have given them grace. You must have given them grace. Danny, when Myra come down with multiple sclerosis, I've always had trouble with that word, sclerosis. Is that right? Did God give you grace? Danny, I can see you now fighting for grace at her loss. But I can see you reaching out for grace. The thing that blessed me is I can see you reaching. I can see you crying out from your heart, God, give me grace. And I appreciate it. I've not been where you're at. I'm not trying to pull back sores. I'm just saying, folks, listen, if we can't come to church and it's not real, I don't want to be here. I'm not in it for a joke. And I hope everything's going good for you today. And I hope everything's, but, but you're going to need grace. And you're going to need more grace than you ever knew you needed somewhere at some point in your life. Brett, you're, aren't you, do, you, do you have a tire shop down in Mountain Grove? Do you ever need grace for any customers? Brett, can I charge these tires to you? I'll be in next week and pay for them. That'll break you if you ain't careful. I'm telling you right now, you, there, there, there might be more than one tire shop in Mountain Grove went broke because people wouldn't pay for their tires and their, and their bills. A lot of businesses go broke because people will not pay their bills. In my book, I, I mentioned that about the store. Why? There, there's a chapter called Going Broke. Why? Because people stop by that country store and charge, go on into town, pay cash. Charge a loaf of bread, charge, you know, $10 worth of gas. And just somehow another think, well, I'll pay it someday, maybe. And then when it gets beyond that point, if they ever say something to them, then they don't want to give you no more business. Ain't that right? And you need grace. You know, man, uh, I sold some ammunition to a man in, in New York here. I've sold him a lot of ammunition. He's an elderly man. And a guy come in and ordered, I forget how many, three or $4,000 worth of ammo. And he called me up and said, this guy wants this, Reggie. He said, could you ship that out to me real quick? So I fired it out to him, a bunch of 308 ammo. And uh, about a week later, I got a call from him. And he said, boy, I'm in a mess. He said, that guy backed out on me. Said he did, I got it in and said he had already found it somewhere else. And he told me to order it. And he said, now what am I going to do with all this ammo? And 
uh, but I tell you what, they, they ain't all bad. He's, a, he's probably in his 80s. And he said, Reggie, I'm going to be honest, he's got a little old trading post store up there out there in the country. Sells ammo and stuff, you know, and a lot of different stuff. And, uh, you know, he said, Reggie, he said, could I just pay you $500 or $1,000 as long as I'm able to? And I said, sure. You know, and he did that. And his daughter called me the other day. He said, Reggie, what's the balance on it? We want to get it paid off. And they did, you know. Ain't everybody crooked. But here's what he told me. He said, Reggie, it wouldn't have bothered me so bad, but he is a preacher. The guy told him, said, you order that, said, I, I, I'm going to buy, I want you to order that, that much. I mean, you know, it takes grace, amen? amen? And preachers will do wrong. If you, think they, if you think preachers won't mess up, you're crazy. It takes grace to deal with people. It takes grace to, to go to church with each other. It takes grace to live in the same house together. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 12, 28. Who's got that? Hey, do you know it takes grace to have babies? Amen. What do you think, Delia? Is your name Delia or Delia? All right. Bless your heart. I'll never forget. I called her Delia. Probably to you is what, 20 years old? 21. Okay. <laughs> and one day she says, Reggie, you've never called me by my name. I said, I thought it was Delia. She said, Oh, you wanted me to marry you with using your name right. That was the only reason. Oh, okay. <laughs> you didn't want me to get up there in front of everybody and say, Delia, do you take <laughs> And her name is Delia. Delia, not Delia, but I, I got Delia. That's what us hillbillies do. We do that. We do that. And uh, but anyway, Delia, I still love you. Amen. But it takes grace to have kids, don't it? It takes grace to change diapers and run here and run there and go to a ball game here and a ball game there and Boy, how many knows it takes grace to be married to a woman? <laughs> Boy, you, you, you are the biggest bunch of cowards I ever saw in my life. You're, you're, you're. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you know what he was doing? He was looking at me going. <laughs> with his right eye. Now, ladies, how many of you ladies say it really does take grace to be married to a man? It really takes a lot of grace. Now, see, these women, they ain't afraid to raise their hand. You guys afraid you ain't going to get supper or something. I don't know what's going on. Go right ahead, right here. This is Hebrews 12, 28. Listen to it. Hey, put that up on the board, boys, if you don't care those verses. Wherefore, oh, you are. Oh. Kingdom, which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. All righty. You know what? The Bible says here that if we're going to serve God acceptably, we're going to have to have grace to do it. You know, but there's a good thing about grace. I don't have to, I don't have to go to the, uh, what do you call them, uh, bank and get it. I don't have to buy it. It's free. And it's abundant and it's sufficient. And there's more grace. And so I'm, this, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I hope I ain't acted down and out. I just be trying, I'm just being real. I just need a little more grace, Lord. That's what I need. A little more grace. You know what's really bad? It's when you know that your spouse knows that you need more grace. <laughs> Run that one by you again. When you know that your spouse knows that you need a little more grace. <laughs> a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Now, this is the big one here. First, you ought to turn this in your Bible. You ought to turn it. Who's got 1 Corinthians 15, 10? Brother Lutz, go ahead. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. <laughs> and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God is with me. <laughs> well, I tell you what, that's, I'm going to be honest with you, and that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it's so loaded with truth, it's amazing. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I have no room to boast about anything, right? right. Can't boast about anything, because I just am what I am by the grace of God. Then... His grace which bestowed upon me was not in vain. Paul said, I didn't waste that grace. But I labored more abundantly than they all. 
mean, you think for a second that he's bragging. Then he tells you, not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Boy, I tell you what, that's so true. So that's grace in Christian service. You're going to serve the Lord in, any, in your home, in your marriage, everywhere, everything is going to be grace. Now, so ladies, I'm going to give you a spiritual assignment from our class. This week, when you see that your husband needs more grace, look at him and go, you need more grace. <laughs> see how that flies. I'm going to hear that all week. <laughs> No, don't do that. You just take it to the Lord and say, Lord, give my husband some grace. Because if, 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 if you say to your husband, honey, you need more grace, he's liable to say, no, you're the one who needs more grace. <laughs> you reckon? Number five, grace and future glory. Somebody got Titus 2, 11 through 13. I know we've done this, but it won't hurt us again. Titus 2, anybody got that? 11 through 13. Yes, Brother Lane. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, grace teaches us to look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible said if we do that, it causes a purification. It's, you know, if we know we're going to meet the Lord and we're causing of that and thoughtful about that, it's going, to, it's going to help us prepare for judgment, standing before the Lord in judgment. Give us grace. So it, uh, it's wonderful. Verse, 1 Peter 1.13. Anybody got that? 1 Peter 1.13. Go ahead. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Grace that is to be brought to you. We're going to need grace all the way through, aren't we? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Who's got that? Yes, Brother Tommy. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, hmm. that ye through his poverty might be rich. Hmm. You don't reckon grace would make you think more of others than yourself. Ephesians 2, 7. Who's got that? Ephesians 2, 7. Yes, no. I, everybody got that? Go ahead. Here it is. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I imagine we're going to sing amazing grace throughout eternity. Amen. I'll bet you anything that if you died today and you burst into glory, you'd have a lot more comprehension how precious grace is than we do right now. Note, finishing up this lesson on that grace, grace is rich. Ephesians 1, 7, we just read it. Ephesians 2, 7, it's sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it's abundant. Romans 5, 17, and it's manifold in 1 Peter 4, 10. Now, I want you to put 1 Peter 4, 10 up, but those are four things about grace that every person needs to know. It's rich, it's sufficient, it's abundant, and it's manifold. What does it mean when we say manifold? What's a manifold on a motor? What's a manifold on a motor? I've always heard him talking about manifold. What's a manifold? Huh? What? Well, let's, okay, we got an intake. And then what happens? Disperses all the air. Okay, so watch this. Here comes God's grace, and it's dispersed over the areas of your life. Manifold, many folds, many applications. Grace of God, grace for my marriage, grace for my family, grace for my work, grace to serve the Lord, grace for suffering, grace for sorrows, manifold grace. Everything you're ever going to need, manifold grace. As every man hath received the gift, and so him minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now watch this. We are stewards of the grace of God. Okay? And, and, and that's, that's important. Kind of grab hold of that. All right. 
We're done with that. So now if you have your Romans uh, lesson number nine, your Romans booklet, we're going to go into Romans chapter six this morning. We've got about 10 minutes and we're going to kick into Romans chapter six. Now, disclaimer, <laughs> tough chapter for me. Romans chapter six, tough chapter for me. And I'm going to lie about it. It's a wonderful chapter, it's a great chapter, some of the greatest truths you're ever going to know in this chapter. But I ain't going to lie to you, it's, it's tough. I, I don't feel like I've ever had a spiritual comprehension of it like I should. I can comprehend chapter 7 better than I do chapter 6. I can grab chapter 8 better than I can chapter 6. Chapter 6 to me is a challenge. So we're going to just take off and read. But on this lesson, number nine, it says, uh, now here's, I want you to write the top of your lesson there. I want you to write this down. The effects of grace. The effects of grace. Okay? What's the effect of grace? Dead to sin, alive to God. Look at the, look at the title of this lesson. Dead to sin, alive to God. Now, this gets tough to me. And, and if you can help me on this, wide open, fire away, because I'm sure looking for help. But I, for 40 years, I've read this, and I just, I struggle with it. And I'm not the only person that has. But there is the biblical doctrine, this lesson, the biblical doctrine that we're going to go for is being dead to sin and alive unto God. Dead to sin and alive unto God. If I had a dead man up here today in a casket, nah, let's just get him out of the casket. Let's just do like, what's old, what's old Jerry Clowers? Let's just set him up on a bar stool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many has ever heard Jerry Clowers' story about, <laughs> boy, I tell you what, <clears throat> he set that, oh, he propped that old boy up between him at the bar, you know. And yeah. <laughs> Did you know he can set a dead man up and, and set a beer out in front of him and he'll never drink it? Yeah, you tell him, you're a sorry, low-down scumbag. He'll just, he, he won't even smile, frown, or do nothing else. <laughs> what does it mean to be dead? Say, I hate your guts, that dead man. He might shrug his shoulders if he does. He's going to scare me. <laughs> Wouldn't it get you if you walked up to somebody's casket you didn't like, but you went to their funeral and said, I never did like you, and he goes, I didn't like you either. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean to be dead to sin? Dead to sin. Yes. Grace becomes a guardrail in your life. Dead to sin is the old man, and the grace is the new man, allowing God to flow through you accordingly. Yeah. Has to be. Yes. There's a terminology in chapter 5 that you've got to get a hold of before you go into chapter 6, and that's the old man. And the new man. You don't, don't get that, you'll sink. But there's a biblical truth that's hard for me to grasp, and that is that my old man died with Christ when I got saved. That's, we're going to read, you're going to read that here. We are crucified. That's Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. I am buried in Christ. I am risen with Christ. I reign with Christ. I'm seated with Christ. But it's hard for me to grasp that because my reality, I'm walking around down here on dirt, living in a sin-cursed body that is not, God is not fixing up and, and this body. He's going to let it go back to the dust and he give me a new glorified body. I'm having to walk around in this sin-cursed flesh, the old man. If you don't know the doctrine, the old man versus the new man, you won't get this. And it's a big, big subject. But to take you back in the Old Testament to typology, in Noah's Ark, there was two birds he let out. One was the raven, and the other was the dove. The ark is a picture of you in Christ. The ark is a picture of Christ. Noah is a picture of you as a believer in Christ. And the two birds are the two natures you have within you. The raven is your old nature, the flesh. 
The dove is your new nature of the spirit if you've been saved. That raven will do nothing but hunt for dead meat, <laughs> rotten carcasses floating around on the water. That dove went out, found no rest for the sole of his feet. That dove is dead. I'm going to tell you something. That dove is dead to dead stuff. He come back in, found no rest for his feet. Has anybody in here ever seen a dove eating on a dead carcass? I've never. I ain't saying it ain't happened. I'm just saying I've never seen a dove. Dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit in the animal kingdom. Now, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> a raven or a buzzard will be a circle in it before it's dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting on it to die. And we have these two natures, okay? And when you enter into chapter 6, you better have a hold of that. That's all I can tell you. The epistle thus far we're reading here has dealt with the sinner and his salvation. Everybody get this now. Now the subject concerns the saint and his sanctification. We've moved from out of chapter 5 from the whole discourse here being about the sinner and his salvation. Now we're looking at a man that's saved, where grace is reigning, and now God is going to work on us. How many has ever sung the song, he's still working on me? We think that's kid's song. That ain't kid's song. That's old men's song. And he's doing something to conform us to the image of his son. And it's a battle. But this is what we're dealing with now, the saint and the sanctification. So let's talk about a couple things here. Let's talk about wonder why in the last 50 years we switched what we call people who are saved. How many knows that they don't call people by the name they used to call people that are saved? Nowadays they call them believers. And that's not unbiblical, but it's not what people, saved people used to be called. Does anybody know what saved people used to be called? Saints. How many ever heard the song, When the Saints Go Marching In? The Bible talks about saved people as saints. Now, let me tell you something. The devil has perverted that because he got St. Nicholas <laughs> and St. Henry and St. George, and I don't know all them saints they've got, and they, make people, and they supposedly make somebody a saint. That's not sainthood. A person that is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and made righteous by, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ becomes a saint. Can anybody tell me why we don't like to use the word saint. I know a pastor who dresses his congregation continually as saints, 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 saints. Why would, why, why would that be? There's an expectation built into that word. See, if I'm just, what's this? If I'm just a believer and I'm saved and I just believe in Jesus. But if I'm a saint that carries conduct with it. Because we don't want to be dead to sin. We want, it, we want a fire escape. We want an insurance policy. But we don't want a Lord, and we don't want to be sanctified. Now, another word is sanctification. Everybody wants to be saved. I get not, but most people want to be saved. But how many want to be sanctified? I'm going to give you a little something. So we're going, we're going, to, bear the, we're going to bear back, pull the cover back on some things this morning. Let me tell you about, we've heard a little bit of discussion on it. Oh, boy, it's about time to quit. The Catholic Church did have a detrimental effect on the title or, the, or what you call a saint because they made it where the average person, you achieve sainthood by their, uh, condom, by their com commendation and by their, by their ordination. They, they, make, they supposedly the church made somebody a saint. That's false. That's, that's garbage. It's unbiblical. Yeah. So we, did, we moved away from that because we didn't. And the other part about it is, well, I could never live up to Mother Teresa. Well, Mother Teresa, I'm going to tell you something. I hate to tell you this. I'm going to shock you. 
If she was never born again, she's burning in hell today. I'm sorry to tell you that. Right. She's screaming in hell today. I'm telling you right now, if she, she died believing what the Catholic Church, she, she is lost. I'm sorry. I don't care how many good works you do. Good works will not get you into heaven. I don't care if your name is Mother, Mother Teresa or Mary Mother or anything else. You just well come. You just well get honest about it. Truth, truth will make you free. Yep. And when you start telling people, "Well, the church made you a saint," you're building up their self righteousness. That's all you're doing. But if you, but if you have a biblical application where it says that the people that are saved are saints, then there's an expectation of of conduct and obedience that comes with that. That becomes a Christian. That becometh the Bible speaks about this one. That becometh saints. Now I will tell you this: if you left this church service today, saying to yourself, biblically speaking, in Christ I'm a saint. So what does that mean for me? Now let's get to this bottom real quick. Doesn't mean you're super spiritual. It means you have been set aside in Christ. By the grace of God, you've been saved and been made a saint, not by your righteousness, not by how good you live, not by how good a person you are, but by the grace of God. But because of that, I should be motivated to live. We, we've distorted the word saint and the connection to saint until we like don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and there's two reasons. Well, number one, I, I, well, I would never think I was a saint. Or number two, I sure wouldn't want anybody to call me saint at work. It embarrassed me. So there's all, I mean, I'm telling you, when the devil gets into this stuff and gets these words and starts misusing words, it hurts us. And we've gotten away from it. We've gotten away from the way in sanctification. The average person, the average Christian doesn't mind saying he's saved, but he doesn't talk about sanctification. Again, watch this. This may hurt some of your feelings, but there are, Organizations, denominations who preach a second works of grace. Yep. Yep. Okay, there's salvation and then there's a separate work of sanctification that's some kind of a instantaneous work that you pray through to get yep. and it causes you to never sin anymore and that's not true. Yeah. I mean, I've never, I've met people who say I've been saved and sanctified wholly and they sin. And they won't acknowledge what they're doing is sin. That's right. That's right. It's very, very dangerous. Amen. But the, what happens is, you go around and tell somebody, and so what's happened to it? Sanctification itself, the doctrine has been perverted right. until you either deceive yourself that you're sanctified wholly or you pull away from sanctification altogether and say, I don't want anything to do with it. Right. Brother Ray? Yes. I was raised under that. <laughs> and at about the age of 15, I told my parents, I said, I cannot live this. Get this. Get so this. I walked away. Yeah. And I stayed out of church for 40 years. Yeah. And then my mother-in-law come to live with us. At a, there was a period of time. And she said one day, she said, we need to find a church to go to. And I told her and my wife, I said, you guys go out there and find one you like. And I might, or I might not go. But I'm thankful that I did go because I heard the truth. It can mess you up, can't it? Yes, it can mess you up. I'm going to tell you what happens Man. with it. You either get honest with yourself and say, I am not living a lie. I sin. I am not sinless. And so you say, well, I guess I can't live it, so I'll just back away from the whole thing. Or you start saying, you deceive yourself that you're sinless when you're not. Yeah. Yeah. And the things that you're doing, you don't believe are sin. They're redefined as just kind of some kind of a shortcoming, but they're not sin. This stuff is dangerous as a cock cannon. And because of it, 
people have shied away from sanctification. I'm going to do two things and we're going to be done. Do, let's begin this morning with this as we in, enter into Romans chapter 6. Do not be afraid of the terminology of saint and do not be afraid of the terminology of sanctification. Both are true biblical terms. We just need to define them biblically and apply them biblically right to our lives, okay? So let's just kind of head that way with this and we'll pick back up next week. And we'll head into this thing about sanctification. But remember this above everything. That we are what we are by what? Grace. Gr grace. Amen. So that means that it ain't you and I. Amen. amen. It means it's all Jesus. Amen. Did we say the name of Jesus today? Amen. Well, if we have it, we need to say it. Amen. Because I think that's who we're here to worship is Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's stand together and be dismissed and grab a songbook and come on and sing. And uh, it's good to see everybody out today. Bless your heart, I tell you what. I, I hope this, I don't want this to be a heavy Bible class. What, did we get too heavy? No. Uh, we keep, uh, I want some joy with the, you know, but I want truth. And if the truth weights me down a little bit, it's okay. But I want that grace to lift me up. Amen. All right, Brother Lonnie, dismiss us if you would. Lord, we're thankful. thankful to be in your house this morning. Thank you for this good lesson. God, just uh, please speak to our hearts today. Be with Brother Brad as he preaches. Be with the singing and everything that goes on. May your name be honored and glorified in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. Come on. Page number 198. Page number 198.